This is your coffee break. Hey friends, I'm back again this week and I have with me blogger turned author Nicole Galata and I'm so excited to share her story with you. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I want to say first and foremost, what a beautiful book this is. So Nicole has written a book called Eat This Poem, and I would absolutely love to pick your brain about how it all came together. So it started out really as desperation is sort of how (laughs) I discovered poetry in the kitchen. It was not something that I had planned. And the road that I was on at that point in my life, just to give some context, I had finished graduate school. And like so many writers, I know I went through this period where I really struggled to balance my writing time with my career and the new full time job that I had. Mm -hmm. So I sort of worked on that for a couple of years. And then I was at a dinner party with some friends and I was telling uh, someone around the table that, you know, my day job just isn't fulfilling me and I need to figure out some sort of creative outlet. And he suggested that I started a food blog. And at that time, I was sort of in this place where poetry, which is what I studied in grad school, was becoming less and less a part of my life and Mm. cooking had sort of stepped in to fill its place. And this happened over time. And so I didn't realize how strong the transition had been until much later on. (laughs) Um, But at that time, that was back in 2008. And that seemed like a really good solution at the time because I was cooking a lot and enjoying that. And I like to write. So I started my first food blog and I wrote that for about three years before I started to feel an itch. And that's the moment when I realized how far away I had gotten from poetry. Mm -hmm. And I almost felt kind of embarrassed in a way because I had turned my back on this really important part of myself. And I sort of didn't know what to do. So I now had recognized that I missed poetry. I wanted to find my way back to that literary side of myself, but I was in a new stage in my life and I didn't know how to have a relationship with poetry anymore, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I needed to come up with a new plan that really fit into my current circumstances and the life that I had now. So back to that moment of desperation, that's where you found me in standing in a hallway and the place we lived at the time had this really long hallway with a cabinet, closed cabinets at the end of it. And this was uh, December, like the week between Christmas and New Year's. And I was, I had some time off work and I was just sort of pacing around the house trying to figure out what to do next. And again, going back to that nudge, I just sort of felt like, okay, let's just, you know, open the cabinet and pull down a book and just see what happens. And I didn't really know what I would discover. And I was standing there, pulling down books and going back through the lines that I had underlined in the past or pages that I dog eared. And I landed on this poem called Baskets by Louise Gluck. And it's a longer poem. It's uh, set in four different sections. And in the first section, we meet this woman who's at a market, and she's inspecting lettuces and deciding which one to buy. And then later on in the poem, there's there were some references to eggs and lemon. And because I'd been cooking very seriously for the past several years, my mind was thinking in recipes. And so I instantly had one of those aha moments thinking, I could make a recipe out of this poem. (laughs) And that was quite literally the moment that Eat This Poem was born. And I hashed out a lot of different titles and was brainstorming. And within about two or three weeks, I had closed down my old blog and I put my very first post up on eatthispalm.com. And here we are. (laughs) I love it. I love it. What a great, what a great story. I love this image of you just sort of pacing furiously in your house. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Just wondering, like, how do I fit this back in my life? Because you knew that it needed to be in your life. Like, I feel like this was very, like a very visceral feeling for you. It was. And and like I mentioned, it was something that I didn't notice at first. Like when poetry started fading away, it just sort of happened slowly. Like I sort of let my literary magazine subscriptions lapse and I wasn't writing as much of my own poetry. And it just sort of happened over time. And, you know, I became more and more interested in cooking. And then so when I was in the hallway, I really did sort of have that 
physical feeling of something needs to be done. This needs to be fixed, but I honestly didn't know what to do. But I just started simply. I just opened a book and the solution was right there on the page. <laughs> I love it. Oh, what it's one of those like magical moments, I feel. It, it really was. And to be honest, writing a cookbook was not in my plan, you know, mm-hmm. years and years ago. If someone had told me I would end up writing a cookbook, I think I would have <laughs> laughed in their face. I it just wasn't something that I had considered because for so long I I wasn't really a food writer until I started my first food blog. And that really allowed me the time and space to just experiment, to become a better cook, to find my voice around food. So really prior to that, I had never even considered writing a cookbook. So it's funny how creativity sort of leads you to places that you don't always expect. It is. And it's wonderful that you were open to that. You know, a, a lot of people see a new opportunity and they say, oh, writing a cookbook's not for me. And then they just shut it down. What right. what, what made you accept that? Well, I think um, the timing was right because when I started my first food blog, as I mentioned, I did not consider myself a food writer. I had never written about food really up until that point. So my first blog was, um, I felt like it was almost training wheels <laughs> to be prepared <laughs> to write, eat this poem. And if I hadn't gone through the experience of, you know, almost abandoning poetry, focusing solely on food, I don't think I would have even been open in that moment in the hallway to embrace what eat this poem could be. So I think I was just ready for it at that time. And so it made it made a lot more sense um, after I'd been blogging for quite a while. And I could find a way to fuse two things that I love, you know, food and poetry in a way that felt really authentic to me and something that I could be really passionate about. I'm so curious. And I think that this is something that all writers and lovers of words and literature would understand and agree with. But I want to dig a little bit more into this need you have for poetry. When did that start? And how did your love of poetry blossom? So poetry was something that I discovered quite early on, I have a lot of memories when I was really young, just scribbling things in a notebook. And and that time in my life when I was, say, eight or 10, it was, you know, silly songs or rhyming poems and stories and things like that. But there was just something about poetry. I couldn't really explain it. I didn't really know what it was at that time. And then when poetry really took hold was when I was in high school. And I had an experience where my sophomore English class, we all walked to the library one day to pick up copies of the Norton Anthology of Poetry. And we brought them back to our class. And we all spread out on the floor. And our teacher told us to start flipping through the book and just stop on the first poem that your eye lands on and read that poem. And that was the poem that we were going to then try to memorize and discuss with the class and and that sort of thing. And then I think part of the assignment was also to write our own poem in response. And it's funny because I don't remember now if that was actually what we were supposed to do, but I did go home that night and I wrote a poem. And I even though I had been writing before that, that was really the moment that it became very intentional for me. Mm -hmm. And from that time on, I was writing poetry all the time. And I actually had this fear, this very real fear that if I did not write poetry, if I stopped, I would completely lose my ability to do it. And so that actually propelled me forward to just keep writing and writing. And I remember sometimes when I was younger, which just goes to show how you learn how your creativity ebbs and flows over time. And as you get older and sort of more mature in that, you come to trust it more. And this was really the first time I was embracing my creativity. And I I didn't have that trust built in. And so there were times where I maybe went, if I went a few days or a week or something without writing a poem, I got really scared that it would never come again. That is fascinating. And I know that a lot of writers talk about fear as a stumbling block or fear as this, this horrible uh, roadblock (laughs) to their writing. But for you, it was like sort of the, uh, the enabler. It was the this this force that kept you writing. Yeah, as a teenager, it absolutely was. And I think that's because 
you know, maybe I was a little less tarnished by <laughs> the world and creativity and, and all of the implications, you know, when you get older. But yeah, I really did. Um, you know, that was kind of starting my relationship with writing and creativity in a, in a very real way. And the fear definitely propelled me forward. And I think at that time, too, it was kind of writing was really a way to sort out a lot of emotions or things I was feeling. Um, so I was, I was very much, you know, writing as often as I could at that time in my life. As you grew older and matured, um, what did you really look for in a good poem? Or were you writing your own poetry or studying others poetry? Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I started out writing my own poetry. And I did that quite seriously up through grad school. And I had a really wonderful creative writing teacher in high school. And he sort of recognized my interest in writing. And he would give me books to read. He would say, here, you need to read Robinson Jeffers, or you need to read this book by Anne Sexton. And he would just sort of give me this list of poets that I should study and learn from. And so I did you know, emulate them a lot. I think I really gravitated towards confessional poetry at that time, because it just felt so natural and so expressive and sort of emotionally charged, mm -hmm. which was, I think, very freeing in a way to see that you could do that. So at that time in my life, that's sort of what was going on with me. And as I've gotten older, and in terms of also choosing poems for the book and what I put on the blog, I always look for an emotional thread. So I want I want to feel something when I get to the end of a line. That's sort of my mm -hmm. marker. And of course, you know, poetry is subjective, and we're all gonna have different responses to it. But I, I want to get to that last line. And I want to feel something, mm -hmm. whether it's physical or spiritual or whatever it is, I want some emotional impact there. Okay, I'm very interested. This might be a weird question, but I'm so interested <laughs> in different forms of creativity. And I'm looking at poetry, and I'm looking at <clears throat> blogging, and I'm looking at cooking. Do you get that same emotional resonance that you do through poetry as well as like through recipes, through cooking, through creating mm -hmm. recipes? You know, I, I do get a similar feeling. I think anytime I, you know how when you're writing and you're just in the zone and you're feeling really good and the words are flowing, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, when you're in that state, I think whether it's writing a recipe or, you know, an essay or a poem or whatever it is, when I'm in that space, everything feels really good. And it it does have that emotional resonance for me. And I think, and in reading other people's work, you know, I think a recipe can have emotional resonance the same as a poem, you know, it, it's just about how you use the words and the language that we all have at our disposal. I love this. I'm getting a sense of this just enormous heart. And I, I think that that comes from maybe my own memories of food and kitchens and just this sense mm -hmm. of home and belonging. Yeah. Do you also get that from the poetry that you read and write and enjoy as well? I really do. And it's funny now sort of being on the other side of the book, a couple people have mentioned uh, when I was at an event recently, uh, one of the writers said, you know, I noticed that a lot of the poems have references to home and family and memory. And I think that is something that we all gravitate towards in a way. So it's sort of just a natural expression of, of comfort and food inherently, I think is very comforting. And it is so much associated with memory and family. And, you know, there are so many meals that we eat that are just, you know, we just need to get dinner on the table, or we just grab a quick breakfast or whatever. And that there's a time and place for those meals, too. But there are so many that just become part of us in ways that in the moment we might not think about. But then later on, down the line, you might have an experience where you tasted something that was really similar to something that your grandmother used to make or whatever, you just sort of have these moments that are wrapped up in, in memory and just takes you right back to when you were younger. And I've had that same experience with poems as well. So I'm, I'm yeah. a, I love poetry. And I used to commute uh, to my old job, and I would ride the bus. And my mm -hmm. little seven minute bus ride was the perfect time to read a poem. And now when I go back and read a poem, it does, it transports me back to sitting on this bus in Chicago. And I, I can't put my finger on exactly what it is. But I think that there's a very deep relationship there between these moments that are important to us that we take the time to experience that poetry sort of draws out, or makes yeah. larger. 
Absolutely. And it sort of reminds me. So when I was back in my hallway, <laughs> when I was looking at these, I, the, one of the reasons that I was a little bit nervous to start opening all these books was because I had that same feeling where I knew that they would transport me back to a previous time. And when you look at those pages that you dog eared or when you underline something, that was important to you in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so when you go back, you're almost, you know, revisiting, you know, part of your former self or, you know, a, a time that's gone by. So yeah, there is something really transporting about that. And kind of, I almost got chills when you were talking about being on the bus because yeah, it's just so powerful that, that poetry and, and art can really do that. And I love that you touch on that trepidation, too, that we feel um, mm -hmm. revisiting a poem that we know maybe made us feel something very powerful. And maybe there's a little bit of fear there that you won't feel that way again when you read it a second time and you don't want to lose that. Right. Well, it totally makes sense. And I think on the flip side of that, the the upside is there's also a possibility mm -hmm. that you could read the poem and experience something new and fresh, which I've been experiencing now as I've been going back through the book where these poems that I chose some of them, you know, two or three years ago to be in this book. And I chose them for a reason at that time and wrote about them. And now I'm going back and rereading the poems and finding new things that I love about them that I had, <laughs> didn't even mention the first time. So I, I sort of love that about poetry. I do too. It just shows how rich a medium it is that there's just so much buried in those few words. I love it. Yeah. And it's kind of the combination of where you are in your life and what you've experienced and new and sort of the growth that you've had, like the poem stays the same, right? But we're the ones that, that change. And so we, we bring a new perspective to it, depending on kind of that life stage that we're in. Oh, this is just what I love, like geeking out about poetry with you. This is so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Me too. This is so much fun. <laughs> I kind of want to, as much as I love talking about poetry, I want to shift gears just a little bit. I know I have a lot of listeners who are going to be just desperately interested in how you made the transition from a blogger to a published author. Would you mind yes. uh, indulging us a little bit? Sure. So my journey, I will say, was a little longer than most. And I, I sort of had an experience where on the one hand, it's every writer's dream where I actually had an editor approach me about the cookbook. So I'd been writing the blog for about six months and an editor at the publisher that I ultimately ended up going with emailed me and said, hey, I've read your blog. Have you thought about exploring the idea of a cookbook? And so that's really what started this whole process, which so that was great. But that being said, from the time I got that email to this moment in time when the book is published was almost five years. I think on average, the life cycle of a book is about two years in terms of the development process and all of that. Mine was certainly on the longer side of things. And that was, I think, for a couple of reasons. So one of the reasons was my publisher and the editors, they really loved the concept. So I had I had a solid book idea, but there was the whole issue of you don't have, you know, your audience isn't big enough. It was one of those issues where they wanted to pursue this, but they were very adamant about me also looking into some marketing strategies <laughs> that I could do to just get a wider reach before they committed to publishing the book. So that was something that I had to work on for a couple of years. And that whole time I kept in touch with the editor. I worked on a proposal. I would send her sample chapters of every couple of months. I would send her updates on what something new that I was doing from a marketing standpoint to just keep them up to speed. So this process went on for quite a while. And eventually I sort of had a moment where I decided, you know, I want to write this book. I know that it will happen when the time is right but I'm not going to wait to get a contract to start writing. Mm -hmm. So I decided to just write the book. So that was something that I worked on for probably a couple of years. And I was working full time and commuting as well. And so I would write on my lunch breaks and on the weekends and do recipe testing when I could and just sort of worked the writing process and the recipe development into my normal routine. So I didn't feel rushed in the process, which I thought was really great. Mm -hmm. But then I got to a point where 
I was actually pregnant with my son and I was literally about to give birth like in a couple of weeks. And I didn't have an agent this entire time because I was working directly with an editor. So, so the editor sort of filled in that role a little bit, but I was getting to the point where we'd been working on this project for a long time. It was in a really good place. And I had a feeling that we were almost at that moment where they were going to make an offer. And I just thought, you know what? I cannot do this alone. (laughs) Mm. I'm about to have a newborn. I need, I'm at the point where I needed the help. So um, I ended up getting a, sort of a referral through a friend of a friend. It was all sort of social media based, which is amazing that we can do this nowadays. And I, I literally on a Friday morning, I had a phone call with this potential agent in New York. We completely hit it off that same afternoon. I got a contract from her agency to kind of sign on um, for the literary agency. And then on mon- the next Monday, I gave birth to my son and on Tuesday, my publisher gave an offer for the book. So thank goodness I had my agent in place because she took care of all of those details while I was, you know, in the hospital and coming home with a brand new baby. So so that was my journey from blog to book. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's so it's so simultaneously. I'm glad that you had the time to create and experiment and do all those things, but then wow, what a like yeah, a I, I really am too. And even though it took a lot longer in retrospect and going through the process, I'm really grateful for how it all worked out because I, and I'm the kind of writer too, I'm a big thinker and I, I need time and space to sort of step back from something or think about it for a really long time. And I never, I didn't want to feel rushed in a project like this either. And so I loved having the space to just do it sort of on my own timeline without the pressure of having that manuscript deadline that you had to hit. Mm -hmm. So that, and especially as, you know, kind of a working writer who has a day job, that just worked so well for me. And one of the other things that I really loved that my editor did early on, so the very first iteration of my proposal looked completely different than the book looks now. And it was structured more like a regular cookbook where you have, you know, the appetizers and main course and dessert and all of that. Mm -hmm. And they had an editorial meeting and talked about it. And then the editor came back to me and she said, you know, we really love, you know, this concept of pairing recipes and poetry, but we just feel like something's missing. We can't quite put our finger on it, but we'd love for you to just take some time, think about it and just let us know what you come up with. And that is not something that I think happens very often. Um, So I was basically given this freedom to go back and rethink the entire structure of the book and come up with something that ultimately ended up being even more meaningful. So that was sort of a gift at the very beginning of this process, too, that really helped shape uh, the book over time. So when you started, you didn't have what they said, you know, a big enough audience. How did you go about building that audience? Yeah, so there were a few things that I did. And this again, this was all sort of over time, nothing was really a quick fix. But one of the things that I did was I started a newsletter. That was something that I I hadn't done before. And I hadn't really been communicating directly with any of my readers other than just putting blog posts up. And, and really, these days, I feel like having a newsletter is so critical because, you know, an email is permission and it's one of the most effective ways to be communicating with people who care about your work and are interested in what you have to offer. And at the beginning, I basically, I think I made all the biggest mistakes that you make in a newsletter where I sent it out. I didn't really have a structure. So I just said, Oh, I'm inspired today. And it's Tuesday. So I'll send a newsletter out. And then I maybe wouldn't write one for three weeks. Or maybe I do them three times a week. I mean, there was, <laughs> there was no rhyme or reason to it. I had no strategy. I had no plan. It was just whenever I felt like it, um, which was sort of fine as I was getting going. But I think there is something to be said for consistency and becoming reliable um, in someone's inbox so they know what to expect from you. So I went through a period um, where I actually wrote monthly because I was I was very busy at my day job and I didn't feel like I had the capacity to do more than that. 
So I stuck with the monthly and then about a little more than a year ago and sort of in preparation for the book launch that I knew was coming, I switched to a weekly format so I could be uh, talking with people more frequently. So a newsletter is really important, I think, because it helps people get to know you and it builds trust over time and it's a place to be honest and vulnerable. And I think that really resonates with people. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first things I started doing. And then um, another thing was I came up with this concept called the literary city guides, which are on my site. And these are travel guides with sort of a literary spin where we focus on food, of course, because that's important, but we also Mm -hmm. focus on where you can find, you know, local events or readings and libraries and, and that sort of thing. That was something that completely came about because of that directive from the publisher saying you need to figure out a way to get more people to your website. And I was thinking about how there's really kind of an intersection between travel and kind of the literary life where when I whenever I go on vacation, I'm usually looking for a great coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And I love to find a little local bookstore so I can pick up a book as a souvenir of my trip. And so I had this idea and I reached out, I wrote the guide for Los Angeles and I reached out to two friends in other cities to put the first few guides together and publish them. And then a crazy thing happened, which is the guides just took off and people started emailing me asking if they could write a guide for their town, (laughs) which I sort of, I thought I would have to do a little more legwork on my end, but once I got a little bit of traction, I think people are just so excited to share all the literary offerings in their cities. And so they're all written by local writers. Um, And so that was something that drew a lot of traffic to my site over time. And in some months, it's actually more popular than the blog page. It's sort of the first stop for a lot of people to discover Eat This Poem. So that ended up helping a lot where it was something that I think if and to sort of have a more practical application and not just literary city guides. But I think if you can find something that's collaborative, where you can involve your community and your readers in your site, I think that's sort of a win-win for everybody because then they share with their networks, you know, what they've contributed. And then you're also just sort of fostering this sense of community, which I think is great as well. Yeah. So those are a couple of things I did. There are a few more, like I started doing a little more freelance work too, just to sort of get my name out there and and build some relationships as well. Um, But it's something that I really believe it's sort of, you build an audience one reader at a time and it's not something that, you, you sort of have to take a long view of it. You're, it's not something that, oh, two months from now, I'm going to have you know all this traffic. It's You're really in it for the long haul. And the way I always explain it to people is if you think about your writing career as a whole and that you will be a writer for your entire life, that sort of gives you a different perspective too, where you're planning long term. You know, you're not just trying to think short term, like, where am I going to be six months from now? You're thinking, what kind of a readership do I want to have in three years? I just I want to listen to you talk for hours. Um, Well, maybe we should do this again. (laughs) um, Yes, please. Uh, Whenever you want to be on my show again, just have just contact me or contact me yourself. This is amazing. I want to ask where uh, where can people find you online? Where can they get their own copy of Eat This Poem? Tell us where to find you. Yes. So the Eat This Poem cookbook can be picked up on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble, Powell's and IndieBound. And then it is in quite a few uh, local independent bookstores. You could uh, check in with your local store um, if you want to support local bookstores, which is also great. Mm -hmm. And then you can find me online at eatthispoem.com. And on Twitter and Instagram, my handle is just my full name, Nicole Galata, spelled out. And I also write about writing at NicoleMGalata.com. Wonderful. I am going to make sure that I link to all of those in the show notes for today's episode. And wow, in the meantime, Nicole, this has just been a whirlwind of amazingness. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your beautiful words and descriptions with us. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. 